We're in session 35 of a series of sessions on the spiritual gifts. This session will deal with the gift of apostleship. Welcome to all you who are watching by DVD. Welcome back to all of you who are in the classroom. In the last session, we talked about the spiritual gift of miracles. Once again, we said like healings, miracles is in the plural, meaning there's different kinds of miracles. We also talked about the fact that it is an explosion of power. It is chosen of God in a unique situation to demonstrate His power as a witness to those who do not believe in Him. They witness the miracle. There's awe and wonder and amazement at what has happened, and that becomes a platform for those individuals to accept Jesus Christ. In this session, we'll begin our study of two gifts that are associated with the feet. These are both gifts where you literally go somewhere. The first is the gift of apostleships. Some spiritual gifts are church positions and offices. And those offices also are associated with the gifts themselves. For example, there is the office of evangelist there is the gift of evangelism. There's the office of pastor shepherd, the gift of shepherding. Prophet and prophecy, teacher and teaching, and the office of apostle and the gift of apostleship. There are some people who believe that the office of apostle only applies to the 12 disciples who were given the title apostles, and then Paul, who is given the title of apostle. And there are a few others in the New Testament, including Barnabas, who are called apostles. And the belief of these scholars is that once they died, the office died. And in a sense, that's true. Those were specifically given the designation apostles. But the function of the office of apostle continues in the church today. And it's continued by those people who have the gift of apostleship. So it's very likely that the office no longer is in place, but the gift itself is still operating. Don't confuse the office with the gift. Whenever we talk about the office, we're talking about something. Whenever we talk about the gift, we're talking about someone, the Holy Spirit. So there are two separate and different things. One is uh, inanimate. It's not alive. It's the office. One is animate. It's alive. It exists. The Holy Spirit who dwells in each of us. Years ago, when I first started going to the current church I attend, uh, I met a couple, uh, Mark and his wife, whose name escapes me at the moment. But Mark and his family felt the call of God to go to Russia. Now, this was during the era where there were not good feelings between the United States and the then Soviet Union. And it was quite a risky thing for them as Americans to decide to come to Russia as missionaries to preach the gospel. Recently, I came across uh, their name in on Facebook and I found that they are still ministering here in Russia in one of the countries that is now uh, separated from the previous Soviet Union and they are doing a work of discipling a work of evangelism and of course they are trying as much as possible to take the responsibility give responsibility for the ministry to those who live in the country itself the gift of apostleship is the gift most closely associated with the position of missionary. And as we go through this, you'll see how missionaries fit the description of apostles and apostleship. Would you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we have been the past few times, because the gifts we've been talking about are in that section. 1 Corinthians 12, and then come down to verse 28 and 29. 
in verse 28, Paul says, And in the church God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also, also those having the gifts of healing, those able to help others. Then he goes on to talk about administration and tongues, and in verse 29 he says, are all apostles, meaning no, we have different gifts. Well, the word that's used there for apostle in the Greek is apostolos, apostolos, it's G649, and it is used throughout the Bible whenever the term apostle is used. And it refers to the office, but in the office the gift is exercised. The meaning, literally, of this term is one sent forth. One who has a mission and they're being sent forth to accomplish it. And in Thayer's, it says that it is not only one sent forth, but it's sent forth with orders to do something on behalf of an authority who has sent them forth. It's to be a delegate or a messenger. The root word is apostello, apostello, G649. It means to order someone to go to a place that's been appointed on behalf of an authority. It's as if one was sent by God as his represented to do something on his behalf. And it always suggests that there is some authority, some officials who have sent forth this person to accomplish its task. There is one other passage that we have not gone to very often, but we will in, in the next future sessions. Would you turn to Ephesians chapter 4? One of the three main passages along with 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're just going to come down to verse 11, which I have told you is a key verse in understanding spiritual gifts. It says, It was He, meaning God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Notice that apostles is listed first. Whenever there is a list where apostles is mentioned, apostles is listed first. Not because it's most important, but because it has a larger scope of impact in the body of Christ. And there is no role in the body of Christ, no position that has greater impact in a larger area than the gift of apostleship. The definition that we're going to use is one sent forth with orders. One sent forth with orders. And the purpose is to represent God in an assigned task. It may be that God has, through this organization or authority, has sent someone to do something. Or they might have been sent to say something. In other words, take action or give a message. And both of these are seen throughout the gospel. The role of this gift is clearly the founding, the extending of the church. And the gift mix usually associated with the gift of apostleship is evangelism, leadership, helps, and wisdom. Commentators discussing this gift include Chuck Smith who says, if we stick to the literal meaning of the word, one sent forth, I guess it would apply most closely to a missionary today. There is no missionary who should be sent out without the backing of a church or an organization, a missions organization. You don't choose to go to the mission field on your own. If you do, you are not really an apostle. You are a person going out to do work 
you've chosen to do. You see, God works through the church. God works through Christian organizations to call out from among it someone who will go forth and preach the gospel as a missionary. And there is a ceremony that's usually involved where elders lay on hands, which they give their blessing, but they also transfer authority to the person that you are representing us and you are representing God to go out as a missionary to win people to Jesus Christ. So there's always an organization, a church behind the missions uh, field. David Gusick says, ambassadors are special ambassadors of God's work. The first century apostles were used to lay the foundation that others have built on. So there's no denying that those first 12 apostles and Paul and Barnabas and the others with that title, their work was absolutely critical because the church is only as strong as the foundation that was laid. But never forget this, the church is always just one generation from disappearing. That is, we know about Jesus Christ, but if we don't share the gospel with other people younger than us who are coming up and they don't come to Christ, the church is in danger of no longer being in existence. God would not allow that to happen but it does give us pause to think about the importance of our responsibility of sharing the gospel, whether we have the gift of evangelism, uh, whether we have the gift of evangelism or not, whether we have the gift of apostleship or not. We are to share the gospel. We are to send forth people who will do so on the frontier of Christianity. Ministry Tools says, the gift of apostleship is to be sent forth to new frontiers with the gospel, providing leadership over church bodies, new church bodies, and maintaining authority over spiritual matters pertaining to the church. Paul is the model of this. When he goes out on his missionary journeys, he not only preaches the gospel, he also establishes churches in each city. And then he appoints elders to assume the responsibility once he has moved on. That is the work of an apostle. His mission, assigned by God, was to go out and found churches in the early church. And there are often apostles today who in their home country feel called of God to leave one church and go and start another church. And that usually is with the blessing of the original church. That they see that their church has grown, they see the work that God is doing in this individual, and they give their blessings so that uh, the individual with the gift of apostleship is going out, being sent forth to start another church with the blessing of the original church. The visual aid I want you to think of is a soldier saluting. Yes, sir, because that, in essence, is what the gift is. God calls you to do something, bring a message, undertake a task, start a church. Yes, sir. The church sets you apart to do some special work and sends you forth to do it. Yes, sir. It's not a question of if you'll do it. It's a question of when do I leave? There is a saying in my country that you say, yes, sir, how high should I jump? And the idea is I will do what you tell me to do. You tell me to jump, I'll jump. You tell me to go, yes, sir, I'll go. So think of that visual aid which encapsulates the view of what the gift of apostleship is. First, someone who has been called, designated, appointed to go out as an ambassador, as a representative for God, and who is being sent on behalf of an authority, a church, a Christian organization. 
While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS Ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13? Acts 13, and we'll look at just verses 1 through 4. And I encourage you, those of you watching by DVD, to join the students in this class who are opening their Bibles to Acts 13 as I'm talking. It's important for you to see the words written in your own Bible. In Acts chapter 13, at the start of what is called the first missionary journey, here's what is written. In the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, whom we know is Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is apostleship in action. The church is gathered and worshiping. The church united and fellowshipping. They sense, the leaders sense, the people sense that the Holy Spirit is calling out somebody for special work. And they reply by designating those people to go out and do the work. And as I said before, they place their hands on them, a blessing and a transfer of power to go forward and to do the work. In this case, the work was to spread the gospel, to found churches, to go to places where people had not gone before. Paul, till his dying day, had this desire to preach Christ where no man had ever preached Christ before. God had instilled that into him. I also want you to notice that in uh, verse 2, where the Holy Spirit is speaking, he says, Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This was part of the unique purpose for their life. In our very first session, we talked about how spiritual gifts, to a large extent, tell you why you're here on earth. Well, it's clear that Paul and Barnabas, they both had the gifts of evangelism. They had the gift of uh, apostleship. We know that Barnabas had the gift of um, encouragement and we see both of them doing teaching. So we assume that that was in their gift mix as well. And they were, those gifts were given to these two individuals purposely by God because in his foreknowledge, he had created them for this work. And at the right time, at his appointed time, in his kairos, God called them out for work to do. I want you all to know there is work for you to do. It may not be as an apostle. It will be associated with whatever your spiritual gift or gifts may be because God knows that you need those gifts to accomplish the work. As we move forward in other sessions, we will come back to this theme in order to be able to help people not only identify their spiritual gift, but from their spiritual gift to be able to identify what has the, what's the work God has called you to do. In essence, why are you here on earth? And again, your spiritual gift tells you to a great extent. I know that I'm here on earth to teach. Now, for me, it's a little more clear than just teaching, but all I really need to know is God made me to be a teacher. So teach. Whatever your gift ends up being, 
you know that you needed that gift in order to be able to do the work that God wants you to do. So identifying your gift is very important. And how do you do that? Well, truthfully, you don't listen to someone like me alone. This helps you to identify your gift. It helps you to understand spiritual gifts. But the only way you know your spiritual gift is to get out there and serve. Go try ministry. Notice where God does something special in a way that you can't take credit for. Notice where people give you feedback that God has, in fact, used you to impact them. And notice within yourself where there's excitement and joy in being used, where the energy increases within you rather than the energy being depleted, where you say, I'd love to do that again, instead of, I hope I never have to do that again. These are the ways you know your spiritual gifts. So while I'm grateful and glad that you have joined us and that you're learning about spiritual gifts, I can't tell you what your gift is. And you won't learn your spiritual gift by just watching these DVDs, by just sitting in this class. You will learn about them. You'll be able to begin to sort in your mind which it might be. The only way you know is to serve. So I will have no control over that. When you finish watching this DVD, when you finish taking this class, you have the responsibility to go out and to do something with it. God never gives you knowledge that he expects you to just keep to yourself. He always gives you knowledge so that you will go out and bless others with it. So go out and bless your knowledge of spiritual gifts with others by trying out the gifts, by beginning with the ones that seem the most likely gifts for you. And when you notice that God touches your heart, touches other people's heart, and shows up in a way that is inexplicable, then you'll know it's your spiritual gift. I know of such a man. His name is Jim. And Jim is a very special man for me. He was the pastor of our church when my wife passed away. He conducted the funeral for her. And when it was the evening that she suffered her stroke, Jim walked with me step by step of the way. He stayed there in the hospital with me for hours because I was in shock when the doctors asked me questions. I hardly heard what they were saying. When they were giving me information, I couldn't take it in. And Jim stood there and he would say, Steve, now here's what the doctor's saying. I've often told my friend Jim that he was Jesus in blue jeans to me. And I am grateful for a man like that. I'm also grateful for him because he's an apostle. He was called by our church for a special task. As you've heard in my talks, our church is very large. And they did a study and they found that about 30 minutes away from the church, the number of people who came to the church started dropping off. So in other words, you did a radius of 30 minutes and that was about the limit of how, people would, how many people would come to the church. And then they went out 60 minutes away and they thought, saw that there were a few people, like me and my family, crazy enough to drive that far to go to that church. But there were only a few. And then they knew that there was a whole world who needed the resources that my church has. And so they came up with a plan. The local church would be responsible for those within 30 minutes. And they would set up regional sites for those between 30 and 60 minutes. And I go now to a regional site five minutes from my home, not 45 minutes from my home as the main church was. It has all of the programs the main church does. And when the message is given, we see it on DVD 
that was given the night before. And the most amazing thing is, people applaud when something happens, people laugh, and you're watching a DVD. It's like you're there. And I realize the truth is for me, when I went to the main church, I usually watched the monitors because I couldn't see them down there on the stage. So it really didn't change for me. So I got involved in this regional site. Jim was the man who started those regional sites. He was the apostle that the church laid hands on and said, go forth, we're sending you out with a special task. You start the regional churches. We now have four of them with a fifth one planned. More than that, our church was among the first in my country to start this idea of having regional sites. Now, many, many, many churches around the world are doing the same thing. So in a sense, Jim not only started our regional churches, but he started the movement to have regional churches. That's an apostle. That's one sent forth, specific task, and it blesses many, many people. The last part was the main church, the regional churches, and then we have an organization that works around the world to bring things like the Leadership Summit uh, internationally that some of you have attended. Now I have some questions for you. Again, these apply to apostleship. You listen to them. Think through, have I seen God work in this way in my life? Or is it something that I would be interested to watch God work in my life? The first question is, has God worked through you too go to a specific place to preach the gospel or to start a ministry? Second question, has God called you to represent Him by being sent out to deliver a message or to complete a task? And third, has God worked through you to start a new ministry or church and then, once started, you grow restless and you sense God is moving you to start something else. See, apostles are never content with just one task. When that task is completed, they start to get a little anxious. I, I, there's something else I want to do. And they take on another task and then another task. And they are the people who are the messengers of God. They are the people who are His representatives to take on the tasks He wants accomplished in His world. Well, we have just one more spiritual gift to talk about. In our next session, join us for the spiritual gift of evangelism. But we're not through with this course. There are applications of spiritual gifts that we need to talk about further. But we're glad that you've joined us to this point and should, after the next session, have knowledge of all of the spiritual gifts. We look forward to seeing you next time.